Do you like what you hear? Then you need a deaf and bass. Deaf and bass. Better by design. Whether you're old school, or whether you're new school, we discuss it all for the only one that matters. Folks, today's guest is Marcus Elsie, a friend of mine that I've known for a number of years, and he is a worship pastor in a wonderful church uh, in the Cartersville area of Georgia, and I think you're going to enjoy this interview. He is a perfect example of a self-taught musician whom God is using in big ways. So, without any further ado, let's join our interview in progress. Folks, welcome to another episode of For the Only One That Matters. Today's guest is an old friend of mine. His name is Marcus Elzey. We've known each other since you were at Burnt Hickory. How long ago yep, was fall that? Of 20, that was, that was uh, October of 2017. Wow, six stinking years. It's hmm. pretty crazy, man. It's totally crazy. So yep. how have you been and what have you been doing since then? Man, I'm I'm doing great, man. Uh, life's good. Uh, at, at most recently, um, I am at Cross Point City Church. Uh, we're a, a multi-site church uh, based northwest Georgia area. So we have a location in Cartersville, one in Adairsville, which is the location I'm at. And then we have a, a location that was launched in uh, 2021 in Rome, Georgia. Wow. So. And I'm a worship minister, and I also do some student uh, ministry as well. Cool. So is that your full-time gig now? You don't have a day job? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's I mean, it, you, man. I'm living, you guys only living work the on, dream. You only work on Wednesdays and Sundays, right? That's that's the perception, I think. <laughs> <laughs> what? Is, that's not truth? What? No, 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 no. It, it's a uh, – yeah, it's, it's, it's all the time, man. I love it, though. This is um, – it's been great to be able to step fully into that calling. Um, you know, it really, it was at Burnt Hickory when I really uh, discovered that that's, that was the direction God was leading me. And uh, it took a few years post, uh, post my time there. And uh, I, I became full-time uh, January of 2021. Well, now, Point, so. how did, all right, I, I know the answer to this question for me, and I'll share that with you in a minute, but how did you know that this was what, God was calling you to do. I mean, a lot of people are, you're, you're obviously you're a talented musician, right? We, we, I played with you. I, uh, you got great chops on the guitar. You sing well, you lead well. And, and everybody's standing outside looking at you goes, of course he can do that. But when did you know <laughs> that, you know, that, you know, that, you know, that this is what God was calling you to do? Yeah, man, I really feel like it was something that he revealed to me over a period of time. And it, it, I've just had a heart for the church, the local mm -hmm. church in general uh, for a long time. And uh, it, it's funny how I got to Burnt Hickory. I was, I was asked to fill in on a Sunday. And then the following week I was told, Hey, do you want to come in and, and be the guy uh, on an interim basis for a while? And I said, no, I said, Ab I said, no, I'm good. I don't want to do that. I'm happy what I'm doing right now. Uh, I was working in logistics, you know, uh, chasing the the financial dream of success right? right and um the american dream so to speak and uh i just felt like god was really pulling on my heart that you know what i think i need to to reach back out to the pastors and say hey if you guys are still needing somebody uh i'm willing i'm willing to come and this is two weeks after i was so i immediately i figured there's no i mean it's already been filled and to my surprise I said, come on. Yeah, absolutely. We still need somebody. Um, so I came on to Burnt Hickory and then I, I just really saw uh, through that time, my heart that I have, not just for the local church, but for God's people right. and, and just in shepherding and caring for and providing pastoral care for folks, checking in, loving on folks and, and teaching and investing in others. And it was really through all of that that I saw that, you know, I think God has something else in store for mine and my family's life 
uh, in the future. And just, you know, through a few other things that happened, uh, I, I was really feeling like that was the journey that uh, my family was going to be on. And like I said, I was working in logistics, uh, was actually being very, very successful at what I was doing at the time. And uh, I just prayed. I said, God, if you would, if this is the path that you have for me, I just pray you would open the door. And no joke, a week later, I get called into the office at my job. They say, hey, we've had a lot of financial setbacks. So we're having to let you go. <laughs> oh, I saw that and coming. It, oh, man. And what, 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 was, what I learned from that is that, you know, sometimes God's going to open a door, but uh, sometimes he's going to close the door that you're currently walking through first. Right. And, and because I know if it were on my own uh, decision, like if, if the opportunity was there to go into ministry while I was still doing what I was doing, there was a possibility that I would have, uh, I wouldn't have gone after it. There's right. a possibility I could have possibly, you know, I would have said, you know what, I'm going to stick with what I'm doing. I'm making a, a, a great income. I'm able to provide for my family. We're able to do what we want when we want it. Um, and I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have chosen that path possibly. All right. But, so now you get laid uh, off from a great paying job. Yes. What happened? What happens next? So what happens next is I'm actually hanging. So I, I was going to cross point. Um, I, I've been technically with cross point since it launched in 2006. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I've just been around there forever. And, uh, so I get laid off from my job. I go and I'm hanging out just at the church one day. I'm taking about a month off. Uh, I had, uh, thankfully the company was gracious and gave me a good severance. So I could take some time to figure out what I wanted to do and what, what direction I'm going to go. And so I'm hanging out at the church, you know, I'm filling out applications, whatever. And, uh, uh, a, a couple of people that work at the church were walking by and they're, they're talking about internship program. And they look at me and say, Marcus, why don't you intern? I'm like, man, I'm 28 years old, 29 years old at this point. I said, dude, I can't, I can't intern. I'm too old. And they said, Oh no, there's no age limit on it right now. So you should totally intern. So my wife and I prayed about it. Said, is this something that, that we want to do? It, it doesn't make sense at the time. And, we said, look, you know, we, we both felt like that ministry was in my future and this could be, this could be the pathway to it. Right. Nothing guaranteed, but if anything, you know, it gives me more ministry experience. So, um, I go in and go into the internship program, you know, internship programs, they don't pay anything. Right. So right. it's, you know, you do it for the experience and for the investment, the intellectual investment the experience, uh, that investment into your life, not necessarily for the money. So I still had to get a full-time job. So I work at a factory for a little bit and through a few other jobs I was working at eventually. So I was doing this internship and I eventually make my way into, uh, selling cars again. And I remember that. that. Was, I remember that. Yeah. I, yeah. I sold, I sold cars. That was my first job when I got married. Um, and, I was pretty good at it. I really did enjoy it because I was around people all day. So that was always fun. But I, uh, it was interesting. I had a very set schedule when I was selling cars and it allowed me to do the internship, still be able to do ministry. And my son had just been born. So he was a, he was, he was born Thanksgiving day of 2020. So this is December 1st. Uh, maybe a few days afterwards, the the manager of the dealership comes in and says, everybody's working bell to bell Monday through Saturday. And me and my wife are like, oh my gosh, we, we have a newborn at home. Our daughter is, uh, she's four or five at the time. I can't remember how old she was at the time. She's, she's about to turn seven, but you know, it's, you know, there, that's a lot to handle. My wife has just had a baby. She's, you know, she's off for a little bit, but like, what do we do after that? And I remember I got a phone call from uh, our, uh, I'm trying to, to put it simply, he was like our creative arts pastor. He, mm -hmm. he calls me up and he says, Hey, I'm just letting you know, there's an opening that's coming up in a daresville. Uh, if that's something that you're interested in. And I was like, dude, me and my wife have been praying for this. Absolutely. Heck yeah. He said, well, I still want you to pray about it with your wife. I said, okay, that's fine. Uh, but he said, you know, it's going to be part-time. Uh, I said, okay, I'll, we'll make it work. You know, I'll, I'll get a side hustle, something I need to do in order to make it work. And uh, we, the, 
as the phone calls finishing up, I say, hey, by the way, I'm sorry I haven't been able to be on top of everything like I normally am supposed to. He says, what do you mean? I said, well, I normally do this, 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 and this. And it was all things that were helpful to the ministry. And it's not anything I had to do. It was just things I love to do and enjoy doing. He said, huh, well, that's interesting that you're doing all that stuff. So he says, well, call me after you've prayed about it. I say, okay, that's fine. So you call him back five well, minutes. I, five minutes later, you call well, him I back. wanted to. <laughs> well, I talked to my wife. I call him. I, I text him the next morning. I say, hey, man, let me know when you can when you can chat. And he calls. He actually calls me and. Uh, he says, OK, uh, given everything else that you're doing right now and how it's it's helping, um, this is actually a full time thing now. And it was it, it was just such a huge blessing. And just it, wow. it's, it was absolutely amazing. Like, you know, me and my wife, we both cried when we heard that, that, you know, God made everything work out. And it you know, sometimes the, the journey doesn't look like how you expect it's going to look. Right. We see that all the time in Scripture. Right. Yep, <laughs> Roger that. But but you know the uh, the the final destination still was the same. Right? He he still wow. got us to where we felt like he was calling us to. So well, you know it's it's, been, it's, it's interesting. Been when I got saved, uh, I had a, an incredible. Uh, I, I was saved under the ministry of a full pen, full full on Pentecostal black full gospel church choir. All right, you think Brooklyn Tabernacle, mm-hmm. Brooklyn Tab Choir on steroids, right? I'm in boot camp and I'm going to church. Oh, yeah. I'm going to church in boot camp because that was the last place my company commander would be. I wasn't a Christian, but I knew he was a devil. <laughs> so I wanted nothing to do with that man. So, <laughs> and church was the last place he'd be at, right? So I went to church and once, and they would bring in different churches from the community and they would, you know, for the Protestant service. So one week it might be Methodist, one week it might be Baptist. Well, this one week, it was a Baptist preacher who was a hellfire and brimstone, old school, air sucking preacher. And, uh, but he, he was a wordsmith. He talked about heaven. You could hear the angels singing. He talked about hell. You could feel the flames licking up around your ankles. Right? So I remember thinking, mm. huh, there's something to this. So I go back the next Sunday and this Sunday, they have a, a full gospel, black Pentecostal church of Jesus Christ, United Methodist, something or other a name about that long, big black robes, uh, purple robes, uh, with the, the black ladies with the tambourines and little twirly things hanging off them. Hammond B3 organ that, <laughs> that worked with the preacher, right? And the Lord said, Wah! and the bass player thumping. It was amazing. One in the same, right? Oh my gosh. I went, I, I, I elbowed my way to the front like it was a stinking mosh pit because I had never seen anything like this before in my <laughs> life. And, and I never heard music like this before. I never heard black gospel music. And it, the harmonies were just washing over me. And I just remember closing my eyes, just enjoying the music and realizing I was crying. And I didn't know why I was crying because I felt great. But then all of a sudden, I knew that Jesus was standing right over here to my right. And if I put out my hand, I put it on his shoulders. Now, here's where my story deviates from most people's salvation stories. I was overwhelmed with terror, absolute terror. And these words go mm. through my mind. Depart from me, you wicked, to the fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And I remember thinking, I, I remember not think, being able to think anything. For what, I didn't know what these, that those were Bible words. And then these other words went through my head. You've been, you've been judged in the scales and found wanting. And if the gates to hell had opened up behind me at that moment, I would have walked through without an argument. I knew I was guilty. Again, I didn't know these words were Bible words. I knew I was a sinful man in the presence of a sinless and pure God. Death mm. was my, that's what I, that's what I owed him. And, but then these words go through my head, but I've loved you with an everlasting love. Well, now ugly crying starts. And I'm gloriously saved. Mm. And at the same time, I had this, like this, my Pentecost friends get all googly eyed over this. I got, I had this fever that went from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. I mean, honestly, it was like a flush, a fever. And then I heard his voice as clear as yours saying, I have ministry for you. So I'm thinking I'm going to be a preacher or worship guy because I was a musician. And they called them ministers of music back then. And, uh, but for the next 15 years, none of those doors ever opened. Um, I worked hard at it. I, I studied, I went to b- online, well, online male Bible study courses and was studying Greek and Hebrew. And I was being mentored by a pastor. I was leading worship at a, a four square church. I mean, I was doing all the stuff and, but God kept slamming doors shut, kept slamming doors shut. Well, long story short, lots of years later, I realized I'm not going to be a preacher. I'm not going to be a worship pastor. I still have this question about ministry. 
And I remember asking God, says, all right, Lord, I swear this will be the last time I ask this question. <laughs> I'm sure he laughs when I say that. Uh, but you promised me ministry. And he said, oh, I, I've got ministry for you. You're a husband, you're a father, you're a friend. Fulfill your ministry. He says, you're asking if you can have a job in the church. That answer is no, but ministry, you got a life of ministry ahead of you. And it was like this huge load gets lifted off my shoulders. And all this, it freed me up as a musician, first of all, because I wasn't, I wasn't trying to be a, I wasn't trying to make myself a square peg jamming myself into a round hole where it didn't fit. That isn't what the place God had for me. God showed me that mm -hmm. I'm going to be a side man. I'm never going to be a front man. And gosh, there's freedom in knowing that. And I have all oh, the yeah. skills. My, my spiritual gifts are teaching, administration, and prophecy. Mm -hmm. And talking to my wife about this once, I said, you know, I know God doesn't want me working in the church, but these gifts, teaching, administration, prophecy, what? She said, oh, I'm so, I'm so tired of hearing this conversation. This is why we marry our wives, because they're smarter than we are. <laughs> she said, your <laughs> yes, gifts are teaching, yes. administration, prophecy, right? I said, yeah. She said, all right. How many, and this is like about 10, 15 years ago. How many of the students that you teach are Christians or come from Christian families? I said, all of them. Teaching, check. You're teaching the next generation worshiper believers, check. Mm -hmm. Said um, administration. Are you booking lessons? Are you scheduling lessons? Are you taking in money? Blah 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 blah. I said, yeah. Administration, check. Prophecy. Are you speaking God's word into the lives of your students every chance you get? I said, yes. She said, check. She says, honey, you've been in the ministry for the last 15 years. And you didn't even know it. <laughs> <laughs> and then she, I remember her just That's shaking. That's amazing. Her head. She shook her head and went men and walked away. <laughs> But that's yeah, it's it, funny. My my wife did the same thing where she'll she'll help me see the things that are right in front of my face. You know, we don't see them. It's incredible. Well, you know, it's it's uh, we don't. it's one of the it, it was one of the most freeing things when I because my vision of ministry was this big. You know, I, I God said he had ministry. So I'm going to be a preacher, teacher or a worship pastor or something like that. But God's ministry is definition of ministry is huge. And this last right. couple of years going We're really through the all Bible, in full time ministry, you know. Oh, absolutely. The minute you walk out your, no, the minute yeah. you put your feet on the floor, when you wake up in the morning, you're in ministry. And that's absolutely right. And I began to think that the clerical collar thing, that's not the only way we do it. In fact, I'm freer now than I would be if I were in a church position, I think. Mm -hmm. So, but every now and then I get the itch, you know, saying, ah, gosh, that'd be <laughs> kind of cool, Lord. Yeah. You know, okay, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and yeah, you're was, absolutely right though you know your ministry starts at home you know you put you know you put jesus first and you gotta put your wife and you put your kids and then the 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 the, the church ministry comes after that it, it, but it's you know if you're not if you're not leading your your wife you're not leading your family how can you ever expect to lead others uh paul said well, something like that to like, timothy right oh yeah he right. told he told you know he said a man who doesn't take care of his own uh family is worse than an infidel and that was a real ugly word back then mm -hmm. oh, we yeah. would so it's infidel. So, yeah i know <laughs> and I, I did during that time frame i did have a preacher call ask once right because i asked him I said, how do you know you're called to something and he said and he knew i was talking about the worship ministry he said can you picture yourself doing anything else i said yeah he said you're not called he said it's when exactly god calls you to something well. yeah he said if you're if you're called to something, it's in your bones. You can't get rid mm -hmm. of it. You can't not do it. And honestly, that's the way I feel about right. teaching music in my private in my private lessons and the podcast and stuff I'm doing. Uh, every morning I wake up, I'm thinking about I'm involved in music 24-7. Mm -hmm. I'm right where I'm supposed to be. If I had your gig, um, there's I don't think I, I know I wouldn't be as happy as I am. Mm. But if you're called to it, you're a square peg. You're in a square hole. That's where you're supposed to be. Yep. That's exactly right. So now. That's exactly right. So you're in a Daresville. Uh, mm -hmm. Describe describe your church. What, what If you were to, if you had two minutes with me in an elevator to tell me about your church, what would you say? Man, I, I would say sound biblical teaching, first of all. Our, our pastor is such an incredible communicator. Uh, his name's James Griffin, and uh, he's amazing. Like, you know, he, he just opens up the Bible, man. He, he breaks it down. Like he's, I know he's that. I know that. Scripture. Name. 
I know oh, that you, name. Well, you you knew uh, uh, Westridge, right? Didn't you? Weren't you at Westridge yes, for a minute? Yes. Yep. So he came from Westridge, and, and and we can talk about this in a little bit about kind of how he got connected with us. It's a, it's a it's kind of a long story, but it's uh, really a grace of God that that we have him and our church is where it is right now. That's where I know him from. Uh, all all the facts really point to our church shouldn't exist and we shouldn't be growing and thriving like it is. But that's the grace of God, man. It's yep. it's amazing. But he man, he's a he's a next level teacher and communicator and uh, uh, love the guy. But he's so he he's a great teacher of the Bible, teaches straight from Scripture, and you know he doesn't sugarcoat anything either. You know he he he's not trying to dance around certain issues. Like he'll he'll say this is what the Bible says. So that's the first thing I would say, you know, I would say we're definitely a modern styled church and we are, we're one church in multiple locations. So we're not three churches that are doing just each like their own different thing. Like we're, we are one church and we're very similar in, in the way that we do things at all locations. There are certain things that we have some flexibility in uh, just mainly because we all have different types of places that we meet at. So our right. partial location has its, has its own building and our other two locations are, portable church plants technically uh-huh. um so like we meet we meet at adairsville middle school in adairsville and it, it's portable we set it up tear it down every single week and uh yeah man, we have uh uh you know full band worship uh modern worship songs and sometimes we do some some modern arrangements of some traditional worship songs too and uh yeah, i mean it's just a it's a place where we all come together and and we get the community that we need while we worship the god that we need and it's, I love it, man. It's a great place, a great family. You know, it's, it's funny. I, when I, I went, when the pandemic started, um, and then of course I was diagnosed with congestive heart failure two and a half years ago. And right. it, it sure sounds, it sounds so much worse. I mean, I can milk this thing and probably get a blue parking spot if I wanted, but it, it's really <laughs> bad. They got pills it's handled, but, uh, but during that time, the pandemic cat, we, w- there was a lot of uncertainty about my health and we were, at, we were very careful. I was pretty much housebound for two years. I didn't leave the house for two years, very rarely. Uh, and, uh, while well, we're getting this thing under control, uh, cause if, if COVID had hit me hard while I had, well, at the beginning stages of this thing, it could have, it could have been pretty ugly. So right. I'm, I'm home by myself. 24 seven for almost two years. What am I going to do? And I I remember just, I started off by just sleeping a lot, (laughs) but eventually that gets old, you know? And, and, uh, Mm -hmm. and I remember thinking, gosh, what am I going to do? So I decided I hadn't done a devote Bible devotionals in 18 bazillion years. And for some Mm -hmm. reason or another, I've never been able to be a guy who sits in a corner, reads the Bible to himself and prays and get it out of a system that way. I had to give myself some way to present it. And, and I, so I started doing a Facebook live uh, where I would do a chapter of the, of the new Testament every day. And I started going to, I went through the gospel of John first, and then I used the book of acts as my template. And then as Paul goes on his journey in the book of acts, uh, when uh, he'd get to a place where he'd write a, where he was going to write a letter or something, we'd go to that letter. So I used the book of acts as my script to go through the rest of the new Testament. And that took about a, a little over a year. And I and I discovered something about myself that I'm very verbal. I solve problems verbally. I have to think with my mouth open. I have to throw the words out there and almost <laughs> like I see them in front of me, right? And uh, it took my wife years to learn that I'm not making pronouncements. I'm just thinking with my mouth open. I'm considering options, um, except when it comes to guitars. I usually mean what I say about that. But she and I have had several discussions <laughs> about that. But, <laughs> but it, it, so I started, I started going th- and I started, God just totally changed my life inside and out in the process of doing this by making myself accountable to Facebook every morning. And that went away because the internet is squirrely at my house. But so I'm still posting my devotionals every day, uh, still doing them, recording them at night, uploading them at night, put them out there in the morning. But as I went through the New Testament, it's like this huge spotlight comes on and i start seeing the unifying if you were to tell me uh ask me three years ago page what's the overlying message of the new testament i would have babbled on about something but it would be to hide the fact that i didn't know what i was talking about Mm -hmm. but now if you were to ask me that i would tell you it's easy 
the overlying message of the New Testament. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Mm -hmm. Love your neighbor as yourself. Every yeah. epistle amplifies one or the other of those mm -hmm. concepts. Mm -hmm. And that's, of course, that was Jesus's response. And he said, what's right. the greatest law? I said, oh, the greatest law, obviously, love God. Yep. But then the second one is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so that was amazing. Well, I finished the New Testament. And now I, I started, I went back through the Old Testament, started at Genesis, and I worked my way up to where Joshua was getting ready to go in to take Jericho. Mm -hmm. Moses is gone. They're standing, they're, they're assembling at the side of the Jordan. And I'm gone back and I'm taking a break from that. I'm going back into the gospel of Mark now. But mm. the whole process of this has just totally, uh, it's changed me. Oh, wow. And it's like... Um, I had forgotten the power of devotional Bible study. Now, mm -hmm. I've always been a deep diver, I, you know, the Hebrew, the Greek, all that stuff. I got to yeah. go. I got to go. I, I love word studies. I love going in there and just pulling stuff out. But there is there is a power available to us believers through the devotional where you just read a chapter and you say, all right, God, what do I know about you from this? Mm -hmm. And what do I find out about me from this? Yes. Those are the two questions I ask. That's mm -hmm. it. What is it about God that I need to know? What is it about me I need to know? Yes. It, and it has totally, completely changed me. And um, I've, I don't have anxiety about playing anymore. I mean, I used to be anxious because I didn't play enough. Because you got to play. You're a player, right? <laughs> and I'm just discovering a piece that just absolutely stuns me. And out of all that, came stuff like this because I started getting curious. I have all these friends in the Christian community and I'm start and I'm, I'm seeing myself in all kinds of conversations about worship music, hymns, uh, church politics, things that revolve around the ministry, music ministry in churches. And uh, so I started, that's why I started this podcast for the only one that matters because hmm. in the end, we only do this for him. Right. He's the only one that matters. Mm -hmm. If you're doing it for anybody else other than God, then dude, go back to selling cars. That's right. That's exactly it. And uh, so that's so that's what led to this. And um, so now, all right. So you you're uh, does he have like a worship pastor at each of the three campuses? Yeah. So I'm I'm the guy in Adairsville. We have uh, we have somebody who is uh, at our Carsville and also some at our own location. Then we have a uh, we have what's called central staff as well. And they're basically the ones who are designing and developing um, and planning certain things for all the locations to do. Like they're the ones who decide, okay, I think we're going to, we're going to do this arrangement of this song. Here's the set list for this week. Um, those kind of things. Right? right. So, but yeah, each person has its own uh, worship representative, pastor, minister, whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it. Right. Um, and it's like that for, uh, all, all the other positions too, for the most part. So, and we all have a location pastor and then things like it, executive pastor. That's all central. That's, it's like one person who's over all that. Does the, now the sermons, are they simulcast? Yes. Yeah, they are. They are excellent. Yeah. And it's dude, it's amazing how that technology works. It's amazing, dude. It's a lot better than it was when you and I were working together. I mean, in short time, six years ago, things have changed yeah. so much. Yeah, well, it, what's cool is that like I got a, a little taste of that, and that helped me transitioning into my role now is that I had a little bit of experience with it before. You know, mm -hmm. However, you know, we were you know, we were one floor apart from each other that we were simulcasting to as opposed to now we're um, 30 miles away that we're, we're simulcasting to. So wow. but it, it, it's amazing how it works and, and how uh, you know, we, we have an LED wall at our locations, and it just it looks <laughs> – so crisp it looks so good on there it's amazing and well it's really cool is that things like that led wall like we've with us being in a school we uh uh the first four weeks that we were in this school we were setting up and tearing down that thing it's a 16 uh -huh. by 9 led wall and it, it's a uh it's a big old boy to have to set up and tear down every single week and right. thankfully the the principal of the school said you know what you guys could just leave that up so we said, what? That's awesome. So we actually were able to train the school on how to use it. So it's a resource that they can use and we can serve them anytime 
uh, they need anything, whether it's sound, any type of ABL mm -hmm. or using that that piece of equipment, you know, it's it's a win win for everybody. But well, when I was with Westridge uh, East Paulding High School, we went we were at the right, middle school, yeah. then we went to East Paulding High, and to thank them for the, letting us use it, we actually installed their AC system for their gymnasium complex. Oh, wow, that's awesome! It, it didn't have one, and it was a sweat box, and so uh, two a couple Sundays in a summer. Having church in that, the pastor met with the principal and said, you know, we can help with this. <laughs> well, hey, here's the thing. I mean, you don't have those folks from those churches who refuse to put AC in. They're like, this is just like home. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not, I mean, yeah. No. I've been to them before. Yeah, me too. Oh, my gosh. All right. So now, are you from this area or are, yeah. you, are you an implant? I'm born and raised in Cartersville, man. So it's Whoa. my whole life. Cartersville Medical Center where I was born. Wow. Yeah, I, so. I'm a, I'm a transplant. i come from Alaska. You're, I know, right? Even the, the few, the proud, the Alaskans, man. <laughs> yeah. It's uh Oh my gosh. It is. Here's a, here's a cool thing about my family story. My mom did our genealogy for like, she did it for like 30 years before she passed away. And when I moved, when I got out of the Navy in Charleston, I moved to the Metro Atlanta area. She just laughed one day. I said, what's so funny? She says, you're back where it all started. I said, what do you mean? She <laughs> said, Our family emigrated over to the Northeast, New England, uh, second boys of the Mayflower. And a branch of the family stayed in New Jersey. There's Garwoods all over there. It says, your branch, our branch, moved down to Georgia. In fact, the area you're living in right now. And then went to all points west from there. And five generations later, we're in Alaska. And she said, uh, you're, where, you're, where it all, you're back to where it all began. And which was, I, I just, there's something about me that thinks that there's something sig spiritually significant about that. Uh, I'm the first Christian in my family for as far back as I know. I mean, good people, all of us, but I'm the, I'm the first outspoken Christian. Let me put it that way. Hmm. Um, but uh, I really think like God is a stat reestablishing the Garwood name under his banner. Hmm. And my son and my daughter both married Georgia spouses and my grandchildren are being raised and they're both godly. My, my grandchildren, they know the Bible better than grandpa does. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm, I'm seeing God do an incredible thing. And it, and it was just, it's nothing that I would have considered. This isn't why I moved to Georgia. I moved to Georgia because that's where the job was. Yeah. And, uh, and yet to see how God brings all this stuff together and the things that God had to do to bring me here, I think it's significant that I'm here, and I'm not sure why. He'll tell me someday, I'm sure. But man, just uh, think about all the people that you've taught. That's a that's something, man. Uh, you know, every now and you know, I'm sure you feel this. Every now and again, you look around and say, "Is what I'm doing worth it?" Really? I mean, there's times when you get bummed and you just you and you have a bad day and you're thinking, you know, it's, this sucks. Am I? Is what I'm doing really helping anything? Mm -hmm. And um, I got a call from a mom it's about seven or eight years ago and she says hi Paige this is Becky's mom now I taught Becky five or six uh, about eight years prior prior to that Timothy Ministries she says uh, this is Becky's mom uh do you remember me I said yeah I sure do she says I just call up to say thank you hmm. and this is like five or six years after the fact after daughter graduated and I said well thank you for that that's awesome can I ask why she's well uh, I don't know if you remember this, but on her last day in her senior year in school, she came by and you signed her yearbook and everything. Um, you told her something. I said, okay, all right, old man brain here. Tell me what I told her. She, she said, you told her that um, not to fall for the first guy chasing a pretty skirt. And that she, and then you told her she could do anything she wanted to do. Period. That she, that the, it was she could do anything she wanted to do. And I, and I said, wow. She says, and I'm calling up to say thank you because she just kicked that guy to the curb. And I'm hey. telling you from a mama's perspective. And she went on. She went to school, got a psychology degree because that's what her mom wanted. Mom and dad wanted. Then she joined the Coast Guard, and became a gunner on a drug runner boat. And they went out shooting up drug runners for five years. I bet this, you feel like a proud dad, though, like in this, the whole thing. It's just like, man, this I is know. like, that's amazing. She, she, this, this petite little 
pretty little girl manning one of these giant that's amazing. shooting drug boats out of the water and she got out of the coast guard and now she's gone to law school and she's a lawyer now wow man talk about a talk and about a flip. I mean, that's and, amazing and she doesn't play guitar anymore but her mom told i said you know thank you for that but i know she doesn't play guitar anymore she says sweetheart it's it's not always about the guitar no she said sure. you were what my daughter needed and wh- wh- i think anytime i get bummed i think about that story because mm. some some kids i'm a, a dutch uncle to a grandpa a dad um and sometimes they're there they're taking lessons because they just want 30 minutes away from this the craziness that's their life you're there mr holland man oh man you know what i'm talking about mr. i holland's do open. mr holland's open great movie great oh movie. that is an amazing movie i remember shouting at the tv when he was considering running away with that student yeah, no, <laughs> don't do it. And then when he comes home and gets back into bed, you can see the relief on his wife's face because she knew what was happening. Oh, yeah. Man, you, like he says it at the end of the movie. Like, you wonder, like like what you just said, you, know, you wonder if you're making a difference in what you're doing or it, you know, after all these years, you know, he's retired. He's pretty much forced to retire. And at the end, you wonder, has he really made a difference? And I feel especially music teachers. You know, I was I was a band kid all throughout middle and high school. I still play my horn sometimes. Uh, and I will always remember my band directors. They all they had a, a lasting uh, impression on my life. But you know, at the end of that movie, like, he wonders did I did I really make any big any type of impact? And he's like, what is going on in the auditorium? It's the end of the day. He walks in, and there's all these people having this huge assembly just for him and yeah. people that he has made an impression on that he's had an impact on their life. And all so, these former students picking up their instruments, yeah, and sitting and sitting in to play his opus. Yeah, the one the one girl at the beginning, she couldn't play clarinet, but she's governor now. That's so good. <laughs> I know that's awesome. All right, well, who was your band teacher growing up? Who, who's your favorite my, band teacher? Mm, it's it's really tough because I, I loved my middle school teacher and I love my high school teacher. They're both well. Sh- give, me, give, them both the sh- give them both the shout out, Mister Mister Phil Dean in middle school. Mm-hmm. Incredible man. Uh, he's retired now. Uh, he at Cast Middle Cast Middle School in Cartersville. Um, you know, he, he's the one who he was giving me private lessons after school because he saw some something in me. He saw mm-hmm. some type of just musical ability in me. I could hear things and I really worked hard uh, when I played trumpet and I was doing district and all state band and all that stuff. And then in high school, uh, his name's Mac Roberts, and he was the uh, the military and style band director, man. But he he was amazing and, you know, really uh, taught me a lot about self-discipline in order to, you know, if you want something, you need to work for it. And he, he really instilled that in me and my whole life, you know, my, and of course, like people like my parents did, but you know, you never want to listen to your parents when you're that age. So having somebody outside of that, be able to teach me that as well, but yeah, they pushed me and it's because of them that you know, I really started to love and, and uh, really dive into music theory and, mm-hmm. And even music performance, music theory, feeling with music, and it, it's, man, it's, it's like a, a, it's like a bad habit. I just can't get rid of it now. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, my my band teacher, I had two a band and choir, band teacher, Mister Hope, from about sixth grade through high school. Uh, he was absolutely my hero. I was bullied a lot in middle school. We'd well, call it junior high now, and I went, but his band room was a safe place he didn't allow none of that nonsense to go on Mm. so every time i was in his room i was safe and some of the kids who bullied me were in the in that room with me but nobody knocked anything around while he was there mr hope was my hero then mr Mm. buckles was the uh, choir director and i played bass for him and guitar for him for a swing choir and everything and people used to make fun of me for being in the choir in uh, in high school and uh and I said, all right, well, let's see here. We make three trips a year throughout the state, going on these long trips on ferry, you know, the flat bottom ferry boats, it, it extended trips. And there's 16 girls and eight guys. And I just left that hanging there. I said, <laughs> so who's stupid? <laughs> <laughs> and they just started looking at me like, hmm but That's good point <laughs> but they but they but these teachers were also they were like second parents to us i mean they watched mm. over us as if we were their children 
Oh yeah. And uh, I remember one time I was on a going to music theory, a music uh, festival trip, and I snuck a bottle of uh, Calvert's whiskey on board the ferry. <laughs> and it's a flat bottom boat, and me and a friend were knocking back this uh, and Calvert's whiskey. I just, dude, you could you could strip the paint off your car with that <laughs> stuff. I mean, it's there's nothing good about it. But you're 16 years old and you're stupid, so this is what you do. So get what I mean, you can get, man. That's what I know. Is. So uh, me and my friend were knocking that stuff back, and I've never had a tolerance for alcohol at all. So I mean, I promptly uh, the fat, flat bottom ferry boat. We were crossing Salisbury Strait. The swells were coming in east to west, and we were traveling north south. So the boat's going. Oh no! Right, and first, and of course, I got very ill, very, very, very ill, and uh, I didn't know about this till like twenty years later when I got back with Mister Hope. But uh, I was being very ill in the bathroom. Uh, later, I, I, I caught up with Mr. Hope and I was talking with him. He says, hey, do you remember that trip to Juneau for the music festival, 73? I said, yeah. <laughs> he said, uh, you know, one of the, your friends came to me and says, Mr. Hope, Paige has been drinking. <laughs> and he said, where is he? He said, oh, he's in the restroom on the second deck. So he went down the second, he says, I threw up in the bathroom door. I was going to rip your lungs out because that's the way he was. And yeah. he said, but I saw you, <laughs> I saw you wrapped around the toilet. And he said, son, God was doing more to you in that <laughs> than I could ever dream of doing. He said, uh, I just got one question. I said, what, have you drank whiskey since? I said, no, sir, not a <laughs> drop. But that was the kind of, that was the kind of directors we had. And they were just, uh, uh, I, I was one of his favorites, but I, he, that didn't get me out of trouble. Uh, if I talked mm. too much back then they could hit you with sticks and paddles, right? He had, his paddle was called big Bertha. And he, yeah, I know, club, I know it. You see it. You see it in your head. Don't you? I can see it. it yeah. Was maple, mm, maple and yeah. two fisted, two fisted paddle. And I was talking too much. I played bassoon. And I was talking too much. And he said, Gar would get up here, assume the position. So in front of the whole class, arms out in front, leaning against the piano. And he took Big Bertha and he hit me. Now, he was a commercial fisherman. I think he did some commercial fishing during the summer. He was a burly guy. He was a strong man. And mm -hmm. he lifted me off my feet. And I heard a crack. And I, I thought he had broken my femur. Turned out he had cracked paddle across my butt it was oh. and you Ooh. heard the whole you heard the whole class go Ooh. Uh, did you did you feel a little bit of pride from that though like that i, I cracked the paddle like that, that was me <laughs> i was See what i did <laughs> i was famous for weeks but i had to go back to the seat and sit down and i and i played bassoon bassoon has a cup that fits in the bottom of the instrument and a big like a big wide belt of leather that you sit on and that's what holds mm -hmm. it in place right I couldn't sit down. I tried to find a way to levitate and play. Mm. It was, but yeah, so yeah, shout out to our band teachers and choir directors. Did, did, did he come back with a new paddle the next day? Did he have a new one? Yeah, the, the shop, the wood shop guy made paddles for all the teachers. Mm. Yeah, they next all had I, them. Next, yeah. next time he got a pressure tree to piece of wood. Oh. That way it was... <laughs> uh, you know, that happened, that had to have happened in 19... 70 so that's mm. 53 years ago and i can still feel it oh yeah that's 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 a memorable moment you can feel it after 53 years <laughs> i can still deal. i can still hear it <laughs> hear it hear it cutting through the air oh lord have mercy that was bad that was oh that was bad <laughs> and it's funny i always used to get in trouble like that because i always talk too much in class and um <laughs> Even Mr. Hope couldn't stop me. <laughs> he would have been the one. Man, I was I was the opposite because I was always too afraid of my mama. I was, I was too afraid to get in trouble at school because uh, I knew whatever they did to me, she was gonna she was gonna be gonna get me probably fifty times worse. So, mamas oh, are the I, one. Whoo, man, my mama. She would. Yeah, you know, she she was the kind of mama that would make you go pick out your own hickory, you know, and and don't and don't let it be too small. But here's the thing. There's, I, I'm a, I'm a believer that there's no such thing as a good one. 
Um, the small <laughs> ones, the small ones just They're sting whipping. more. Yeah, yeah, they just feel like a thousand bees hitting you, and then you get a big one and just blunt force. You know, it's just, <laughs> you're gonna either have not any fun. You're gonna it's have a, bee it's a lose lose. It's a lose lose. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! You know, it's funny. My mom was that way. My mom was this beautiful, wonderful. She was everybody's grandma, everybody's mom, mm-hmm. and like two. My mom too. Once one weekend a month, she, all our friends would come over to our house, our, our crowd, 15, 16 teenage boys, and she would feed us all. She mm. put on like a big taco feed or spaghetti or whatever, chili. Mm. And then usually there was a school dance that we'd all go to, but we would all sleep over at our house. Mom, everybody loved Mrs. Garwood. Everybody mm. loved Mrs. Garwood. But what we didn't know about Mrs. Garwood, and I didn't know, was that one time my uh, brother got in a beef with her and she put a whipping on him pretty good. And I was stunned to see it happen because my brother, I'd never seen him ever lose a fight. He gotten lots of fights and he never lost one. He never had a chance with this woman. Mm. She tore into him like nobody's business. And she throws him in his room and says, wait till your father gets home. So dad comes home a couple hours later. He says, Paige, get back here. Says, dad, I didn't have nothing to do with it. I swear. I didn't want nothing to do with it. <laughs> and he said, nah, I know, but you need to hear this. So we go in there. And Pat's in his room, and Dad just leans against the door jam and says, I understand you had a problem with your mother today. And I'm thinking, oh, this is where it starts. Pat said, yes, sir. He said, all right, well, suppose I should have told you this before at some point, but might as well tell you now. When your mother and I got married, we worked in a mental institution. And she worked on the third floor where they kept the incorrigible male patients. Son, do you know what incorrigible means? He said, yes, sir, it means uncontrollable. He said, yeah. I've seen down. I've seen your mama take down a 350 pound crazy man. You're nothing. You never will be. <laughs> and Pat, to his credit, just went. Could have used that information later. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that it's would have been late. good to know. It's a little late on that, pops. <laughs> just <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's and my dad was an ex professional athlete. So I was. My sights are always focused on him. Um, but that's that changed after that day. I began to realize, mm-hmm. Dad might be the enforcer. But Mama's the Marine Corps, Army, SEALs, a- Recon Rangers, all that stuff. Spartans <laughs> wrapped into one little round Norwegian Swedish package. Mm. I can just picture it in my mind. Man. Oh gosh, she and she was, she was just, she was an amazing lady. But in more ways than one. Mm-hmm. So now, all right. So you've always been you've been a good you're a good guitar player. Uh, you're a good singer. Um, did you ever go to school to do what you're doing? Uh, no, actually it's, it's all been experience uh, completely. Um, out of, out of high school, I kind of wrestled with what I wanted to do, do. You know, was, I did technically, I, I, I say this quite literally. I, I was enrolled in college for a little bit. Uh huh. I didn't really go to college though, because I, I try to leave the, leave the house and man the couch was right there so i would just find my way to the couch and take me a nap and whatever just not going to class today so um <laughs> but yeah you know I, yeah, that that was i wasn't ready for college after high school i was one of those folks you know like i was really going to try to make other people happy i didn't know what i right. wanted to do so i was um actually had a, a music scholarship um to uh, reinhardt university but i didn't I was talking before how I was, uh, you know, wanted the the financial uh, freedom to do what I wanted. And right. that kind of, you know, gauge, I gauged success based off of how much money I made at that point in time. And mm-hmm. I was like, you know what, I'm going to go into the medical field. And that's, that's where money is. You know, my, my parents were very uh, supportive of that, especially. Uh, so I wanted to make my parents happy and hated it, did terrible. And then I was like, you know what? My grandpa is a CPA, has his own, uh, has his own firm. Uh, you know, I could, I could go into accounting, hated it even more. So it was at that point I said, you know, what? I'm just not going to go to school and I'm going to play music for a bit and uh, found a country band to play in mm-hmm. and played for a few years with them. And my wife and I had been dating since we were both in high school. And I was, was like, you know what? I'm tired of being broke. Um, Tired of not having even enough money to go buy Coca-Cola if I wanted to. So uh, I'll get a job. I had a friend who sold cars. He hooked me up. And so that's what I was doing when I got married. But yeah, never, never went to school uh, for music. 
it's all been experience and learning and soaking in anything that I could from either people I've played with or just resources online. I never would have guessed because uh, I know in our interactions, um, you know what you're doing mm. musically. And yeah. it's, uh, I'm a graduate of Armed Forces School of Music, but I didn't go back to college. That's a six month intensive training thing. They shove like three years of school music school in you in six mm-hmm. months. Oh yeah. You walk out of there, you're a zombie, but, um, but a good player. Mm. But uh, I didn't go back to college till I was, I went back and got my bachelor's degree when I was 50, 48. And then I got oh, wow. my, and I, two years later, I got my bachelor's and then I got my first master's at, from about age, by 50, age 54. And then I finished mm-hmm. my second master's when I was 60. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and they were all pretty much bucket list items because I've got no designs and having a career as a composer, mm-hmm. but I've just always, I've, I'm never done learning. I've never, mm-hmm. I'm always wanting to learn more about music. Music is just the thing. And yeah. I have more music theory knowledge floating around in my skull than should be legal. <laughs> <laughs> and thankfully, you know, I, I had a, a guitar teacher and I had kind of, gone as far as I could on my own and teaching myself. So I, I took lessons for about a year from a guitar teacher who helped. And really what he did, he helped me bridge the gap between my my formal training in band and my amateur self-taught guitar playing. Right. And so he helped me bridge that gap and kind of, you know, tie it together a little bit. And thankfully on a- another another resource I have is that my brother has a master's degree in music education. He's a band director also. So awesome. That, yeah. So he, he's been, he's been teaching for a uh, Carswell middle school for, I think over 10 years now. I can't remember. Wow. Uh, yeah. So we're, we're, we're homegrown and he's both, both working in the, the city and County that we've grown up in. It's isn't really that, cool. isn't so, that some, so it sounds like music is a big deal in your family. Y- you would think so, but it is and it isn't, I would say. You know, my uh my grandfather, he played in bands in the seventies and eighties. So anytime that we would go over to his house when I was little, he had this beater parlor Yamaha guitar that's you know, it's he just let me bang on it. So um didn't know what I was doing. And I remember one day he taught me how to play the intro to Secret Agent Man. And I just thought music was the coolest thing in the world. Secret agent, man. Yeah. Yeah. No, the <laughs> da, na, 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 that thing. But yeah, and he played guitar. He was actually a keys player. He's a, a piano, organ, synthesizer, you know, the, the you know, 70s and 80s. He, he, he geeks out over all that stuff. He loves it. And he's, he's stupid talented at it. But he's really, apart from me and my brother, the only other one in our family that's ever really played an instrument. Um, okay. So like we got a little bit of it from from just hanging out with him when we were when we were kids. But uh, I'd say a lot of my music background came from my parents and just we had a smorgasbord of different types of music that 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 we were just immersed in from an early age. Same uh, here. My mom my, got uh, the Reader's Digest. She would buy the Reader's Digest albums. Mm. Right, they they have the re- uh, she got a subscription and every month you get a new you know big band. I've got I, yeah. I've got all her records. I got all the big band stuff, and then classical guitar: Carlos Montoya, Andre Segovia, mm. Chad Atkins, Glenn Campbell. I grew up listening to all those cats, and uh, yeah. yeah, and they just there was always something going on, always some kind of music being played at our house. Yeah, we it was so different. So my it was so funny going through my dad's uh, uh, tape box, and everybody had a tape cassette box that you kept all your cassettes in. Um, or eight track. I think his one of his trucks had eight track player, and that was pretty much out when I was when I was a kid. But um, but I, I remember we would look. He'd throw one in, and it was thirty eight special, and then take that one out, and then it's uh, Cool in the Gang or Cameo, Rick James, Bobby Brown, all the way to Green Day, uh, Biggie Smalls, Tupac, R. Kelly. Like we listened to everything in his truck that was funk and hair metal classic rock that was everything that we listened to when i was riding uh in my dad's car then when we were with uh, in my mom's car it was loretta lynn country gold 90s country like uh both of them listened to motown like every week i had a, a huge influence from listening to the jackson five temptations yeah uh, supremes michael jackson 
all those guys, man, I, I, a huge influence of mine in just the way that I've learned to play and just things I love to listen to. Um, so yeah, we, we listen to everything. My mom was probably, I still say when she was alive, she was the biggest Loretta Lynn fan to ever walk the earth. So uh, it was really sad when she passed away recently for Aww. our family. But, uh, you know, Loretta Lynn, she was a huge dude. The amount of hits she was on, that her and Conway Twitty, the duets. Oh, my God. We listened yes. to it all, man. We listened to you it know, all. It's, and- it's uh, going – I remember my very first – my friend had a uh, 65 Mustang, and he had an 8-track in the center console, and we, and we had one 8-track tape, Grand Funk Railroad. Yes, come on. And, uh, you know, we're an American band. And then we had uh, um, Taken Care of, BTO, Bachman Turner Overdrive. Yep. We had that. We did listen a lot from that. And what's really hilarious is when my son was in high school, he came down from the other end of the house one day. He said, Dad, Dad, I just heard this new group on the radio. And uh, I said, yeah, what? He said, um, it's uh, uh, Creedence Clearwater Revival. <laughs> and he went, he said, uh, and I just started laughing. He says, they're not new? Well, they were in 1973. <laughs> and I took That's out my amazing. guitar, and I just started ripping through all the Creedence Clearwater hits. And he says, really, Dad, really? I said, yeah, really. You got to go back down and find some other groups from my – you're going you're gonna to love it. And he does. Yeah. He is, he's a total 70s and 80s audiophile. Mm. And, uh, and it's funny. Most of my guitar students are living there. I have a bass student. She says – her goal is to learn all of Paul McCartney's bass lines for all the Beatles albums. That's mm-hmm. what we're, so we're piling. That's a lot of albums, man. We're, That's we're a lot of albums. She's working it. And how many, do you know, how, I know it's, uh, if you look at the amount of albums that they were, they were pushing out in the, really the short amount of time that they were signed. Yeah. It's, you can't do that. Like people don't do that nowadays. Like, and really they haven't in the past 30 years, right? Today it'll take a year to produce an album. But back oh, yeah. then they would, it was not uncommon to punch out an album in a week. Yeah. And I think Carol, it was Willie Nelson has somewhere around like 90 albums or something like that. Carol Kay and you know, the Wrecking Crew and stuff, when they would bring in those stu- with those studio players, they would do an album in a day. Mm-hmm. In a day. Like um, when the Monkees came, they were, they were the musicians behind the Monkees albums in yeah. the beginning. And they would produce a Monkees album in a day. Now, when the Monkees started doing their own, it takes three to six months. But those guys could crank them out in a day it, that to me is just and you go back and listen to the quality of the music oh yeah there was no there was no there was they weren't cheapening anything up it was those guys were amazing well i mean there was no editing you know there, that that whole editing and post is not a thing and it was like you have to get a good take like and, yep. it, and I, i'm still a, i'm a huge proponent of that now like whenever i record and do any type of producing it's you know, you want to get the best source material that you possibly can. Like, yes, you can fix stuff in post, but I don't know. It takes some of the character out of the music when you do it. And so well, we're done. we did a, a, I was at a big church in the area and we did a, a worship album. Mm-hmm. And then we all laid down the tracks and then they, the post folks went in and they would like, take and shift every note. So every note was perfect. Yeah. You just stole the life out of the tune. Mm-hmm. Because music isn't supposed to be perfect. Music's not about being perfect. It's about yeah. telling a story. Mm-hmm. And and we weren't bad. All of us were good players. But they just made they just they were they just just edited the daylights out of it. And yeah. it just it was just a really square sounding album. Mm-hmm. I did a I was in a blues group, the Rhythm Raiders, and we went and recorded an album. We did it totally old school. All of us sitting in a circle, staring at, at each time? other. Yeah. Yep. With waist high baffles in front of the drums and around us. But we had our live amps with mics in front of it. So there was a lot of bleed over between the mics. The singer was in a booth, but it was a glass booth so he could look out and see us. And we laid down the entire album, uh, one or two takes. We would just, oh, wow. because we went in there prepared. And these are songs that we're doing every night. And uh, dude, that album is amazing. Mm-hmm. The 12 people that bought it agree with us. <laughs> it, it's it's an amazing, it, it, it's it's one of those things like you appreciate the technology, but I hate that it's, you know, it, it, it's a shortcut for so many people now. You know, it used yeah. to be that you could go to a concert and there are still some artists that are like this, that you go to a concert, you're like, man, it sounds better than the album. Mm-hmm. That, that, that rarely happens today. I feel like, you know, you, it, you get the energy, you get the atmosphere of just seeing somebody live, but 
you know, so many things are edited and vocalists just are not what they used to be. You know, it's not, yeah. you have to have just the best vocalist in the world because you hear some, you hear some folks that are just, just I don't know, they're just blah. And then, you know, well, Johnny Cash, live, Johnny Cash wasn't great as a singer no. or as a guitar player, but dude, he owned the stage when he got out. He there. did. He did. But I mean, he was, he was still the same guy on the album as he was live. Exactly. So exactly. you got the same guy plus the energy. It's yeah. not, a lesser yeah. vocalist plus energy. It is the same person, the same voice. Now you also get the live, uh, you get the live aspect into it as well. Is that, you know, it's it's not that I have a problem with it in, in the worship world right now, but uh, and I get why they're doing it, but uh, I think there's an overuse of stems. <laughs> it's just <There's> a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and it's on I, the song, yeah. I understand, and I understand they want the, you know you're you're playing a worship song and you want the congregation to hear what they're hearing. Right. But uh, part of me wishes it was old school enough where they'd let the band, if, if, if it's just a four-piece band, let us do a version of that song, our version of it. But it's technology is a blessing and it's a curse. Yeah, it's it's interesting. So I feel like in worship music specifically, like you know, it's, I don't know what, 12 years ago or so, there, there were a lot of like real instrument heavy songs coming out. Mm -hmm. uh, like I'm thinking... Uh, Hill Song Miami, the early elevation stuff, even, yeah. uh, you know, w you would hear some Shane and Shane songs, you know, being played uh, at churches too. Like, but, you know, that's, that's about as bare bones as you could get back then. Right. They were fully acoustic as it was. And then slowly morphed into this a whole lot of scent, a whole lot of tracks. And then it became very, very piano heavy, piano right. driven. And then a lot of pads, you know, guitar pads and guitars doing whale sounds <laughs> and uh but now i'm starting to see where it's coming around a little bit more we're we're getting back to the real you know i, I saw somebody i have a hat that said uh uh make guitars uh, put again. guitars and put guitars and worship music again or something like that and uh, you're starting to hear a little bit a little bit more of that but and also like it's breaking it down you know just getting more just the bare bones you've got folks like uh Maverick City coming out, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, those guys have been killing it. It's about a, as bare bones as you can get. Well, you know, Crowder, that's what I liked about And Crowder, Crowder also, yeah. Crowder will just, he'll use he'll use a bucket with a chain on it. Yep. <laughs> now, I, I can appreciate anybody who has a percussionist that has the goat toes getting the shake sound, you know what I'm talking about? Yes, absolutely. Toes. Love it. Love but, it. I can appreciate that. So now, <laughs> so what? What is what? what's your instrumental lineup at your church? What do you got? And we typically have, uh, uh, I'd say the full the full lineup, with the exception of keys. Keys is where we're we're kind of we're kind of light, but typically you know two guitar players, one or two acoustic players, hand, you know three to four vocalists, drums, bass, and then uh, uh, when when we're extra blessed, we have a uh, piano player. It's great. So, <laughs> but so yeah, you're looking it, you're looking for a keys player to come in? Yeah, man, I'm always looking for a keys player. So. I'm always looking for any player, you know. I want mm -hmm. you know, anybody who wants to serve. By all means, I'm down. Let's go. So. You know, there's a, a a guy by the name of Harold Blackaby, and he wrote a Bible study once. I wish I could remember the name of it, but the gist of the Bible study was discovering God's will. And he he had a thing. He said, "Don't do something. Ask God to bless. Find out what God's blessing and do that." Mm -hmm. And but he also had a thing where he said, "If you want to understand where God's leading you." look around you at your circumstances. Mm. For instance, he said he was a pastor of a church in Canada, had a lot of medical people. So they would go out on medical trips and medical mission trips to the indigenous folks around. And they said, I went to another church. We didn't have medical people. We had construction people. So he said, how stupid would that be to do a medical missionary trip? No, we took our construction people and we went out and built homes and churches and repaired things and ministered that way. So he said, if you look at what God has given you, the cards that God has dealt you, then you and you work with that. And he says, you'll be much more blessed than trying to force something that mm. God isn't saying, isn't providing for. Oh, yeah. So I protect you. The fact that you don't have keys a lot of times, that makes you change things up. It does, man. That means we just get to play striper songs. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Uh, with that, I think I'm just going to close on that because that's awesome. Striper. <laughs> <laughs> Go to my buddy Marcus's church. They do striper tunes. 
Yeah. <laughs> I'm waiting on hair metal to come back, man. I know 90 stuff has come back a lot. I'm really hoping that hair metal comes back. Dude, oh, I wish you were alive back in the 70s with Larry Norman. Dude, um, I, I, I'd grow my hair out. Let's go. He's an unidentified flying object. You'll see him in the air. <laughs> or uh, see, uh, why does God? Why does the devil have all the good rock and roll music? Was another one of his tunes. Yep. So yeah, it was. Uh, um, I'm going up to heaven and I ain't coming back. I'm going up to heaven on a one way <laughs> track. You know you can't just get there on a bus or a plane. You gotta have a, vic- a ticket on that victory train. Singing and a shouting and a getting blessed on the J E S U S Express. That was that was a Jesus music. Man, that 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 hits hard, man. That hits hard. <laughs> yeah. It, it, think ZZ Top uh, behind yeah. that. Dude, come on. <laughs> well, man, That's good stuff. Thank you so much for this. I would love, uh, you know, I've got several podcasts here. This one's for the only one that matters. Uh, I got another one called the Emerging Composer that I'd like to have you on as a guest where we can yeah. we can nerd out on music stuff i love it let's do it and uh because I, I i've i've my head is so full of music theory nerdery mm. uh it's and it's i have some of my students and i and i i sneak music theory in on them because they they say me you say music theory their eyes start rolling to the back of their head yeah and i'll tell them dude music theory is the language of musicians you got to know this stuff that's if right you're, if you're going to be in this business in any way shape or form Mm-hmm. there's a core set of knowledge that you got to wrap yourself around. Yeah, absolutely. And so I would love to, I would love to trade stuff like that back and forth. With you. That would be Let's awesome. Do it. I'd love it, man. Cool. I'll try to keep up with you. It'd be really hard for me, but <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Like I said, most of my, it, it, when I went to get my master's degree uh, in, in composition, uh, the professor I had for six months, uh, they gave a professor every six months. And he says, so what do you want to write? I said, I want to write 16th century medieval choral music. He just stared at me. He said, you know, nobody's writing that stuff now, right? I went, yeah, ain't it great? I'm the, I'll be the only one. <laughs> I said, I hope you're not under the impression that I'm here because I want to develop a career as a composer. <laughs> I'm just, I'm in love with Palestrina and I want to do that stuff. He said, mm. okay, let's go. Yeah. So I, since then, I've written about 12 Curies and a bunch of Glorias and all that kind of mm. stuff. But it's uh, – <laughs> I was right. Nobody's buying it. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> but when it comes back in style, man, you're going to be the guy. I'll be the guy. I'll be there. You'll, you will supply for the demand. <laughs> yeah. You'll both be the only both people. Both people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, God bless you, my friend. It is you absolutely too, cool to catch up with you again. Yes, man. Thank you so much for having me on. And I would someday down the road, because I've got, I only play at Westridge a couple times a month. So sometime down the road, I would love to come and hang out at your church and just pull my guitar up and sit in the corner and, and fiddle along with you guys. Yeah, dude, you come on. I'd love to have you. That'd be great, wouldn't it? That'd be fun. Yeah, dude. All right, my friend. Reunited well, God's, and it feels so good. Yeah, God's blessings to you, dude. Be good. Yeah, you too, brother. See, See you later. Man. Bye. Bye. Much thanks to Marcus for giving of his time and uh, sharing a little bit of his life with us. And thank you for listening to this episode of For the Only One That Matters. <laughs>